between Sheikh Hunter and the department to have him to come back to the department to teach at a senior position and to have his doctoral program. Now, what really was heartbreaking was that Sheikh died the Friday before the Saturday he was supposed to give his inaugural lecture as a full professor and as what we used to say, director of research, somebody who is entitled to supervise students to say, I'm okay with this dissertation and then to be a sponsor of dissertations. He died the Friday before the Saturday he was supposed to give his first inaugural lecture. So this is how I am re related in some kind of a physical way to Sheikh Hamza. Also intellect, intellectually, uh, any African and any body from African descent who grew up from the 1960s into academia and trying to learn more about just what was said in newspapers and on radio, uh, definitely had a, an opportunity to know who she, Professor Sheikh Antibio was. And I'm going to try to tell in very few words how I s see Professor Sheikh Antibio and uh, his such as a uh, remarkable leader in academic field. Because you know that the man had some other strings to his instrument. He was also a political activist. He was the head of a political party. He is the head of an, some kind of a new vision of nationalism in Senegal and beyond Senegal and participated in Senegalese politics uh, as a respected leader. And uh, in fact, I remember that during uh, his last year of, uh, uh, of life, uh, there was problems between the government and the opposition and the government as well as the opposition will always came back to Sheikh Hunter at some point or the, or the other to try to, ha to have him to mediate in some kind of a position because he was really uh, seen as being the senior member of Senegalese politics at the time of his death. And as such, many people owed him respect and paid him respect. And at the same time, as I said, uh, on the academic side, obviously, he was one of the let's say, growing of our academia in Senegal. And the fact that the university was named after Sheikh Hunter Job, the first university and the uh, biggest university in, uh, in uh, Senegal, the University of Dakar, is now called Sheikh Hunter Job University. And at the same time, some other institutions, like the well-known and famous Institut Fondamental d'Afrique Noire, which is the premier research institute on Africa from the Francophone side, let's, let's say, is also named after Professor Sheikh Antedio, among other things. There is some other uh, uh, things which were named after him, and mainly the big street which is passing by the university campus, for those of you who know Dakar. So obviously, Dakar University felt that they lose somebody uh, at the time. And, uh, but as I told you before, this was some kind of an irony because the man was around for almost 20 years at some point and was never really allowed to teach in a proper way. And one of the arguments, of course we know that the core of the argument was political because he was in competition with Senghor for the leadership and obviously uh, Senghor wouldn't let him to between could have exposure to young people. That's, this was the main reason, of course, we know, we know that. But beyond that, one of the technicalities which was always raised was, well, he is a professor of physics. He is already running uh, a labor uh, laboratory. So he cannot have a teaching. I mean, this is a very curious situation when you have this uh, university system saying you cannot teach because you are the head of a laboratory, which is quite bizarre because that's usually the other way around. You're required to teach because you are head of the laboratory. <laughs> but anyway, this is the way it has happened in my country, uh, Senegal. Uh, now, Sheikh Anta is, um, had a, let's say, basically in academic side, two-track, let's say, career. 
What is being a physicist? And being one of the very few Africans trained and being able to use the most sophisticated techniques in the late 50s, the early 60s, to be able to use uh, uh, radiocarbon techniques, nuclear techniques, and so on, in this laboratory, to date uh, fragments, uh, to date uh, uh, bones, I mean, all of this kind of uh, vestige you might think of, in order to be able to substantiate Africa's claim to be the oldest uh, humanity on Earth, to be the oldest civilization on Earth, and also to date the, uh, to provide datation for the artifacts produced by African civilization. And as such, she is known. And for those of you who are aware of the uh, French curriculum, to say that he was a a student of uh, Frédéric jo Joliot Curie and Marie Curie, who is the biggest uh, nuclear physicist France ever produced, maybe second to none, in fact, for that uh, endeavor, and Nobel Prize winners. Uh, he was among the very few Africans who were blessed to be uh, students of those two people. And. Uh, his activities now is uh, more or less seen as being something of a historian's activities. In other words, many people would feel that he is more of a historian than anything else. And yet he has produced many books, many articles, and has conducted many research in linguistics, uh, in math, uh, in many areas that I cannot just give you the list of it. Uh, Sheikh Anta's first exposure and also first, let's say, uh, uh, clash with uh, French academia and also with what you will call academia in general is the defense of his doctoral dissertation in the mid-50s when he discovered that what you say is not accepted as much as you you're able to defend it or to document it. It is also accepted because of who you are in terms of color of skin. We were at the, uh, by the end, but many people did not realize that this was the end of the colonial era, so they persisted to have the old mentality, which is that, well, we French, among others, came to Africa to civilize people who never had a civilization. And if you find a student coming in around to say, well, I'm going to defend my doctoral dissertation to say that Africa was the land of the first civilization on Earth and that the most renowned, the most admired civilization on Earth is the black civilization. Indeed, obviously, this was seen as a major subversive idea. So, Professor Job will suffer, or at least, uh, maybe not in terms of uh, suffering, uh, himself in a physical way, but at least he will be, he will definitely, uh, his career will be in jeopardy just because of that. He will produce some other works you, I'm sure that you are, you are aware of, I'm not going to give you the list of it. And some of them were also seen as a challenge or even as a subversive tool now by the newly independent African countries. Because when he uh, produced, for instance, fundamental cultural technique industrial the future eta federal d'Afrique in other words, putting on sharp, saying this is what we're going to do if we want a federal state in Africa. At a time, in 1960, you speak about countries who want uh, very much to be independent, to have their flag, to have their national anthem, to have an, uh, some kind of representation in New York, uh, uh, Bangkok, or uh, whatever. You, you come to them and you, and, you, and you say, forget about your, your small country's autonomy or sovereignty. Let's, put it, but let's enhance it into some kind of a federal state. It was subversion. It was subversion for many new African countries. So you can understand why also uh, he, was, he would suffer for that. The same way he has suffered for the kind of dissertation he defended uh, uh, before the Sorbonne. So this is, a, in my view, two aspects you have to look at if you want to see the man. Because he never felt that his academic endeavor is limited.
did by the classroom, that he should be speaking about things scholarly, let's say, shaped before students or before his colleagues and his peers or something like that. But also he felt that many ordinary people, many ordinary men in Africa and beyond need to know what is about building Africa. And building Africa is not something just for the future or for the present time. It is also to know where you're going to build Africa. What is the basis upon which you're going to build Africa. And that's why in uh, many considerations, let's say, I would see him rather as a sociologist of history, somebody who wanted to, 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 to bring history into a sociological realm just, than just a purely historian guy, if you might accept that type of definition. So therefore, now we're getting into his own colleagues in Africa and elsewhere. Obviously this is disturbing. Because colleagues, and we do know that, we do admire, we do like people to be within some kind of boundaries. Some people who will come to say, I am a historian and I don't know about physics, I don't care about physics. Or I am a biologist and I don't care about whatever you, want, you might want to, want to do in, I don't know, something else. Because we felt that they are then entitled to, to the floor. They should speak up. They are a legitimate speakers. But whenever you come and you say, well, you know, I'm able to say something about linguistics. I'm able to say about something about uh, sociology. I'm able to say something about history, physics, and so on and so forth. People tend to say, well, he's really some kind of, you know, uh, cannibal, if you could, you know, eating all over the place and maybe even eating from our own, own plates. He's making a shadow for us. And uh, I, I, I titled one article I wrote about Professor Sheikh Antonio, The Shadow of Sheikh Antonio, because I felt that this was really some kind of a very interesting paradox. Because a shadow is good because it will provide for whatever you might think a shadow will provide, but at the same time, something underneath will grow very, I mean, it will be in a very difficult position to grow in a, in a way. And this interaction, I, 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 I called it, I called that, I, called, I titled it The Shadow of Sheikh Hunter Job because of that. And I feel that many scientists, many scholars resented that. They wanted somebody to, to say, to stay within some limits and not to meander or to wander around and to say, and to, and to say well, anything which has to do with uh, scholarship around Africa and around Africans is interesting to me. They, will let, they wouldn't let you do that. And also because maybe a Russian academia is built on those boundaries that they, even their, uh, the students uh, produced by the Western scholarship also agreed and accepted that type of uh, division of uh, thinking. Uh, obviously there, there was many opportunities for Shahanta to to have a public uh, exposure and uh, to make his idea clear and not just for his colleague as I said but also beyond not only through his writings but also through some, um, um, some conferences uh, well known today uh, just to be well, uh, known enough just to be referred by just allusion you know something like the Cairo conference or the Atlanta uh, presentation or the Dakar debate. Uh, those are three major events which took place in the early 80s and really uh, put Sheikh under, under, under the spot. Now, not just for scholars but also for the general public because the idea was quite simple. Since the university and academia is not letting Sheikh Hunter make his presentation in his case for a while, he then will get it to the general public. He will get it to the public, to the public, to the audience who is able to listen, ready to listen, and maybe to make his own case before them, without having always to go into some kind of an uh, underground system where he wasn't appreciated. And, uh, 
I was fortunate enough to be part of the organizers of the 1982-1983 Dakar called Dakar Debates, which was also just the same kind of line uh, when at the history department we said, well, why don't you have this guy around? Why don't you give him the opportunity to uh, to, to have his doctoral seminar, to run a seminar and to be able to supervise people, uh, as well as anyone else who had the same kind of an, uh, credentials. Uh, one of the ideas was, well then, why, don't we, why do we want to limit Sheikh Hatta to this kind of reality, since he is also uh, seen as being a thinker, somebody who is giving ideas to the general public. Why don't we give him some kind of a general ex 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 exposure? And as a general secretary, then I was the general secretary of the uh, Senegalese Association of Historians, or of, of, of the Association of Senegalese Historians, right, yes, the Senegalese Historians Association. I was also part of the bill in terms of organizing the debates. Uh, not Many people did not understand because it was also in the wake of elections and some, was, some people came with the idea that, oh, they want to whack him, so we, we're going to have to defend him. And some other came to those debates with the idea, oh, we, we're, we're going to see him whacked, you know, destroyed or something like that. While the idea was like that. The idea was quite simple. Uh, this is only one step we wanted to pursue we had an agenda then, after Sheikh Hunter, it would have been Abdullah Ali, after Abdullah Ali, it would have been Senghor, after Senghor, for those of you who know Senegalese politics and Senegalese academia, this is because people who are politicians and at the same time are academics. So we wanted to have those people to come uh, once a year, one of them will come around and for a week, for three days or a week, they will agree with some kind of format and everyone will come around, will listen to them, they, they, will, they will be, instead of coming just to say, oh, you're the nice guy, you did everything which was possible to be done on, under the sun, but to have people coming in with some kind of a critical eye and to say, why don't you address this kind of a problem? Or why did you take this position on this particular problem? or I don't agree at all with your stand and we wanted to do that because also we felt that we owe that to the um, Senegalese University in a very general way but uh, that first experience failed because of as I said political expectations so we never uh, were able to do, to do it again but one thing was quite strong we were really happy to see the man accepting to be the first to try that problem. Because we went around and asked some other people to try it and they declined. He was the only one to say, you know, uh, I know that you guys, you're young enough to know something, but also you're too young to know everything. And if we get together, we might be able to come across and to communicate with our young people. Because they are not re reading as you know, as much as they maybe ought to do or used to do or something like that. And since this is going to be some kind of a radio taped or a video taped and will be put in, in the, in the uh, daily newspaper, every, everybody will have an idea of what's going on. I'm willing to do that and I'm going to devote my time. He almost collapsed by the end of the session because it was a one way. We started with the idea of a three, four days session and we ended up by a seven days session. And you're speaking about 9 p.m. to 2 to 3 a.m. And by the end of the week, he was exhausted and almost collapsed. So this is, this is just to give you my personal, and in some kind of fun, you know, I put in the bag a lot of things and it's not well organized. I wasn't supposed to take the floor for such a long time. Uh, but I feel that I owe to you those kind of an information to explain why I feel great to be associated and to be part of this commemoration and to be part of this dedication. Uh, uh, I'm going to give the floor to Professor uh, John Henry Clark who will add a few words and then if you want to 
hit us with questions or if you want to comment or if you want to make some other contribution, we will be happy to answer to your questions and to your comments. Now, Professor Clark, uh, Professor John Henry Clark is from Rutgers University. Hunter College. From Hunter College, sorry, I, I, I always well, tell. Sue you. Oh. Okay. <laughs> they wouldn't. They are happy and no one ever Okay, I'm 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 sorry, since most of his works were uh, published through that uh, anyway, uh, you know Professor John Henry Clark, the amount of considerable work he has produced and his stature I think as being the best senior. Uh, in my view, African American historian now, and I think that uh, just to give you one detail, uh, Phelps Stokes Fund gave to Professor John Henry Clark his Medal of Honor uh, the last spring, and uh, this is for his lifetime achievement. He had many other. Uh, honors like that from Schoenberg and from many institutions, I think that you know him very well. I'm not going to introduce him in details, and I'm going to give the floor to make his own presentation. Mm -hmm. so. uh, I'm appreciative of being here. The focus of my uh, short discourse will be on Sheikh Antadil, my meeting with him, my 20-year relationship with him, my seven-year fight to get his books published in English in this country and the success of, of that fight. I'd like to call your attention to the fact that we have not only shown proper appreciation for Sheikh Antadio as a thinker, we have not shown proper pre appreciation for the African mind as a thinking mechanism with something to contribute to all mankind, to the whole world. And we have forgotten that the first concept of humanity started in Africa, among African people. The greatest of all crimes beyond the middle passage, slavery, is the imprisonment of the mind is to make people think what is not so. What happened to Sheikh Antadio is a crime. It should be listed as a crime, a crime which his own people participated into, into rivalry, jealousy over European acceptance years after independence we still knock at the door of our former oppressor who's not as former as you think he is asking for acceptance and our true liberation will come when we look into a mirror and like what we see when we value ourselves well enough to cater to ourselves. I'm going to come directly to Sheikh Antadio, but I want to look holistically at the African mind as a thinking mechanism with the capacity to change the world with a capacity to challenge all the concepts of the world and put in place a more reasonable set of concepts. 
that would be better for mankind to live. If you understand what I mean, you will also understand my repeated reminder that there is not an African nation in Africa that uses African tradition, African concepts of law, African concepts of morality. And you have to understand what made Egypt great and what made Egypt's parents, the Ethiopians, great. Right now, I run afoul of your teachings. I said Ethiopia was the parent of Egypt, of the country that the Greeks called Egypt. The Ethiopians never called that country Ethiopia originally, and the Egyptians never called that country Egypt. That's too far afield, but I want to let you know that thinking is a natural thing among us, and there were years when we were more intelligent before foreigners, fakers, and fools interfered with our way of life. When we had professional thinkers, his job was just to think. You brought him his shoes, his sandals, his food. His job was to think for the people. And when you needed a problem solved, you came to him. His maintenance and respect was his salary. We lost this and became liberal prostitutes with the values or the lack of values of the foreigners and the fakers and the fools. This is why we have imprisoned our mind by not accepting Africa's greatest <coughs> contribution and not learning what made Egypt great and what made Ethiopia great. It's a simple thing and yet it's a complicated thing. They became great because they had collective discipline and high morality. And for most of their existence, they had no word for jail because no one had ever gone to one. Now you see the damage of the foreigners and the fakers and the fools. And once you read Sheikh Antadio's work and understand the nature of African societies before this interference, you will understand the nature of his great contribution. Then you have to go back and see the basis of our thinking and where somewhere in the march of life we reached a fork in the road and turned in the wrong direction. We lost our concept of African values. We lost track of the great 19th century African mentality. In Africa in the 19th century, when slavery was being transformed from that crude system into a more sophisticated system called colonialism, uh, still another form of slavery, Africans presented resistance throughout that whole continent, throughout this whole century. And Winston Churchill has said, these Africans who never heard of a military school or wore a short store-bought shoe out general some of the finest minds of Europe. Why you do not know anything about them is the fact 
that your mind has been so imprisoned by both colonialism and its aftermath and its propaganda that you dare to look at yourself as a collective hero. You dare to look at your own warriors. You dare to go into that 19th century in the United States and examine the thinking. Martin Delaney, a great Jamaican, Robert Campbell, who went out to Nigeria, Abakuta, to search for a place with Martin Delaney. You dare to look at the work of our, the non-fiction work of the first black novelist, William Wells Brown, the female anti-slavery speakers, Elaine Watkins, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner True, you dare to look at the finest single mind produced in the United States by black Americans in the 19th century, Frederick Douglass, a look at his conflict with Ruswam and others over whether to settle in Liberia or not to settle. Douglass took a principal position that was right and his opposition was also right. Too many times you've been trained by the movies to look for the good guy and the bad guy in the drama. When sometimes you got dramas with all bad guys, you got dramas with all good guys. You don't necessarily have to have a bad guy. Douglas was not a bad guy because he opposed the African migration movement. He said that we had earned our right to stay in this country with our blood and our sweat and our death. And he was right. Delaney and others, Campbell, Ruswan, said that the opening up of Liberia, the settlement of Liberia, gives us an opportunity to prove to the world we once ruled great states and could do it again and they were right so we're not dealing with right or wrong here we deal with two rights in conflict and your american movie mind won't let you deal with two rights in conflict because you still haven't dealt with the two rights in conflict in relationship to W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington, where both of them were right then, both of them were right now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We did not need to devise that Booker T. Washington or W.E.B. Du Bois. We needed Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. Both of them had something to contribute to our own salvation as a people. Then you need to look at the end of that 19th century, when Africans began to send forth great thinkers, you need to look at the life of Edmund Blyton and look at his inaugural address on liberal education, Liberia College, 1881. And look at the Caribbean thinkers, Blyton, others that followed Blyden. Blyden was from the Danish West Indies at the, at the time. And understand that great thinking, great challenges, opening up questions not new to us. I acknowledge Sheikh Antadio as the finest single mind produced in Africa in the 20th century. He came from a great antecedence. He came from a line of Africans who gave the world the concept of the oneness of God. And never used the word God. The word God is un-African. It's another lecture. Organized religion is un-African. Still another lecture. You think you can't do without this hogwash brought by
Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, and it is hogwash. <laughs> the spiritual man is worse because of it. Man's spirituality was never supposed to be organized into something called religions, but don't get me on that because I'm 80 years old, I don't run very fast, and I don't know where the door is. <laughs> Because I think most black people are ex-Baptists who got lost on their way home anyway. <laughs> I first heard of the works of Sheikh Atadio at the first World African Writers Conference. I'm coming home from my first extended trip to Africa. 1958. Sheikh Antadio has participated in that first Congress and the proceedings are in Paris. Also in Paris was Rene Moran, an African who was once the governor of French Equatorial Africa and who wrote a, uh, a novel 1922 that won the equivalent of the Nobel, the Pulitzer Prize. He was alive then. He would die all three, four years later. I would not meet Sheikh Antadio then, but read an essay he had written called The Fundamental Levels of History. I would become interested in his work, interested in the debate over his PhD thesis, I would gather as many of his works as I could when I was in Paris, go home, and later, before I'd even met him, compile 20 most important books on African history, written by Africans themselves. One of the books that he wrote for a PhD thesis that was turned down was in that uh, collection. Around all oh, 67 uh, or thereabout, the first right, the, the second Congress of Africanists was held, was held in Dakar. They had second-rate white participants. Some of the black participants weren't the best they could have chosen. Check out that Diop's laboratory was 300 yards from the hall where the, the lecture was being held, and he wasn't invited. And his his work at all really contradicted the works of some of the white writers. Bubahama of Niger was alive then and finally he became chairman of one of the panels and began to invite the African speakers to the podium. And we played a game of using, if you're going to allow me five minutes, i speak three minutes or four minutes to say that uh, that is not all I have to say, but I will relinquish my time to my distinguished colleague and name another black speaker. So <laughs> we had nothing but black speakers, one after the other, all evening, because none of them would yield the floor. <laughs> and we took over the car. <laughs> we took it over. About the second day, one of the persons who had been secretary to Catherine Dunham, Jeanette Stovall, who was translating the French into English. And 
I don't speak French very well, but when you mispronounce it, misinterpret it, I can catch it, you know, because I know the sounds well enough. As I said, Jenna, do you really translate all that garbage? He said, no, no, man, man. When they say garbage in French, I translate it in English and leave out the garbage. <laughs> Could you, during your lunch hour, take me over to see Chef Etadillon? We walked to his laboratory and I greeted him. I had corresponded with him and he was happy. Then he sat me down and told me he had several books that I had not read. And he gave them to me. He gave me these books and his son over to pick up the books. And that began our friendship. I came back to America determined to bring his books to the attention of a black audience in America. It took me seven years and finally a publisher that had made quite a bit of money on one of my books that I objected to, not because of anything other than the title. It's called American Negro Short Stories. I said, I object to the word Negro being a title in any book I wrote or edited. He said, well, you did. You did sign the contract without noticing this, and you're bound by the contract. He said, well, this is a more commercial title, and you're going to laugh all the way to the bank. <laughs> For the next four years, I made approximately $7,000 a year on that single book. I made, made well over $50,000 on the book before it began to slow down. Then I revised it and brought it out again under the title that I wanted, Black American Short Stories, A Century of the Best. But the important thing here is that one of the partners, Hill and Wing, broke, went from his own company. I figured they made enough money on me and they owe me one. So I pressed Hill to see if he would publish one of Sheck's books. And he wasn't in a position to say no. He didn't know which one he wanted to publish. When I took it up with Sheck, Sheck said, well, I'm dissatisfied with this. I, did, I got to rewrite this. I got to do this. So what Sheck did was to take the best chapters from his already published books and to make a separate book, separate bibliography called African Origins of Civilization, Myth or Reality. The book sold well in the African American community and it is still selling. Mercer Cook, who had been ambassador to Senegal, translated, who, who, who te he taught French at our, and who was a friend of Shaq's, did an excellent trans translation. And the book became popular now. Hill now would publish Black Africa, the politics of a federated state. That little book was and still is a monumental message that Africans still miss. Otherwise, Africa would, would be dominated by the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. And Africa would not be recolonialized as it is, they're not a true independent state in Africa. Africa's not even ruled by Africans, ruled by Africans with African bodies and European minds and sometimes European wives. But in this little book, and you do well to read it well, because he wrote this book at a time Measured against now, 
is one of the finest pieces of prophecy about Africa that Africans still don't appreciate. He said the riverbanks of Africa, now the Niger, the Limpopo, the Congo, can raise enough food to feed Africa and Europe. That Africa was the pride they wanted to conquer. If they don't conquer, they want to disrupt it to the point where the African would turn inward on himself. And that has already happened. To the point where people are now writing articles advocating European recolonization of Africa. Because the African, miseducated in the West, fighting over the crumbs of power, has turned on the African. You don't have an African head of state in Africa with being called leader. Not one, no nope, not even among the Arabs, another bunch of colonial parasites, but that's another lecture too. And I need some protection from a whole lot of people if I deliver that, especially Ali the I need protection from the Muslims who talk a lot about something they don't know a damn thing about. I never met a, I met a, I met the Muslim scholars. Scholars who were Muslim, but not, not scholars who were schol who knew scholarship on the religion. Because nearly all the religions in Africa were imposed on Africa by conquerors. There's nothing sacred about any of it. And African belief systems indigenous was good enough. Now, I don't want to prolong this too much because I want some dialogue. Because you'd have no dialogue with the students or the audience. You haven't said anything anyway. I want you to dare to doubt, dare to challenge, dare to say, I don't believe that. Because most of my life I've been a teacher and I know one thing. You have to open up your mind to say, I don't believe that. And once you open up your mind, I'll put something in it you can't take out. <laughs> we have to look at this book. We have to look at William Lee Hansberry's work, Africa World's Richest Continent. Africa from the point of view of rainfall, from the point of view of hydroelectric potential, has the greatest potential of any continent in the world. Any one part of Africa got ten times more than the Japanese started with. Why can't they put it together? They cannot remember or remind themselves is that powerful people never educate powerless people on the technique they use to be used to take the power away from the previous power so they disrupt they set Africa up to fall apart the tragedy in Uganda was not African it was French The tragedy in the Congo is Belgium, American, French, and English. British propaganda would make German propaganda under Hitler look like a Sunday school lesson. They're so effective. Thirty years after they have left the Calvin Island, Calvin people are still divided among themselves on color lines, class lines. The same line the British is still in their minds. And still thinking of England as a motherland. When they go there, the British tells them something different when they go there to live. But the Sheikh Antidope is more significant. And I want to point out the importance of another word, the cultural unity 
or black Africans. His section, which is take about one third of the book, on the origin of the matrilineal, should be compulsory reading. May this fortunate or unfortunate faith will not ever bless me with dictatorial power. I'd make everybody read a book before they have breakfast. <laughs> and the same people I would execute before they had their breakfast while they're watching me have mine. <laughs> In this book, it should be read especially by misguided black women who are following white women's live movement. It's not about them at all. They should read what she says about the treatment of women. And they should remember it was in Africa that the woman became head of state for the first time. And human history. Rode it to head of her army for the first time in human history. And was a god for the first time in human history. All while the woman in Europe was a vassal. And that the greatest respect was paid to the mother. Now you come down here, you debate, and you let a faker lead people to Washington under the guise that we got to atone. When black women were rising high, in the state. They were supported by black men who let them go and encouraged them to go as far as their mind will take them and did not feel one iota of insecurity because of it. The European has made you feel insecure with women because he's insecure with women. We came out of society where women were not feared but respected. If you don't know your history, you don't know this. We need to point to the last work published before she died, Civilization or Barbarism. Because in this work, Sheik was saying, no more maybe, no more perhaps, this is the story. That is his magnum opus, his final great work that sums up the conclusions of a great career. <clears throat> I'm very pleased to have known him personally over a 20 year period. He was pressured by the government. I used to go to Dekar often and we would meet in a hotel that used to be the leading hotel in Dekar Years ago, before they built the big ones, the Quarter Sioux, the Nova Shell, and the other one. The hotel called, well, not little, but this Quarter Sioux was the, was the hotel before they built the Taringa and all the, all, all the others. The Sheikh would enter from the back. He used to sit in the back beyond the bar. That was kind of a semi darkened area because he didn't want to get me in trouble by letting the government know that I associated with him. What a tragedy that I had to duck and hide to see him as though I was a married man <laughs> visiting a mistress. And to some extent, he was a colleague and a friend. He was going to come to America for a Nile Valley conference. Something happened, he didn't come. Something happened. The airplane, and he thought the science wasn't right. But a great scientific mind, like Sheikh Antadil, has some respect for African traditions. Science. He grew up in a Muslim dominated community and he had respect for their contribution 
in language and all, but he was not an endorser of the Arab presence or the Arab slave trade that's still going on in Africa. He was an intelligent Marxist inasmuch as he did not re swallow it and regurgitate it. And he was making a reassessment of Marxism and what role it could have had in Africa when he died. It's a pity he didn't finish this reassessment. He was moving politically toward the left, but moving more toward the proper use of African traditional values and African civilization. If I said we killed him by neglect, I would be right. Because we killed Du Bois the same way when the Du Bois lived so much longer. We killed Chancellor Williams the same way. But one of the proudest moments of my wandering over the world where African people live was my meeting with Shikanta Dio, my writing an introduction to some of his books published in America, and the fact that the two of us called each other friends. Thank you. in the past. I believe in editing it to the point of making it use. That was African concepts of brotherhood, African concepts of the family that needs to be restored. I don't accept the word animism as used by the Europeans. I don't accept the word primitive as used by the Europeans. I see people need to return to values of their own creation. Every invader of every country, including white invaders of white country, did more harm than good. And there is nothing to the contrary. We need to get out of our mind the idea that anybody civilized anybody anytime. People don't civilize people. People impose on them their way of life at the expense of destroying the indigenous way of life. I do not recommend the return to animism, whatever you mean by animism. I say there is nothing in African traditionalism that rules out modern medicine, modern roads, extensive study. You have to remember that the first concept of a university, the university, uh, Great Lodge at Luxor, started in Africa. The first intellectual gatherings of men and women to discuss the affairs of the state started in Africa. And if you are misguided enough to think the world waited in darkness for Europe to bring the light, then I refuse to have pity on you. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
I'm curious why Sub-Saharan Africa needs to be validated by Egypt and even Ethiopia. Because I would either evaluate you as a total human being by noticing you have two hands, or I would call you a one-handed man. I mean, why Ethiopia and Egypt? Because you find achievements there that you want to claim for Europe. And if you understand the chronology of European history, these achievements occurred before the first European war. A shoe I lived in a house that had a window. Uh, Dr. Clark, uh, will you speak on uh, after the out-migration uh, from Africa, the predators coming back to Africa? So who, who are you talking about? Go, go ahead. Huh? Okay, from the origin. From, from The Supreme Court could have been your grandfather or your uncle. The European did not understand that formation. So what he cannot understand, he will destroy or ridicule because he's insecure in the face of civilization he did not create and cannot understand and he must use the word primitive just like Marx was silly enough to use the word primitive communism what the hell are you talking about primitive communism you had communism and communal societies throughout the world before the war to Europe the European formulized and dogmatized something thinking it began with them and there are some pseudo-black scholars coward enough to accept it. I don't belong among them. Dr. Clark, there's a new book out by Dr. Obingo to speak of an African philosopher in world history. And in that book, he deal with the uh, linguistic factor or the, the connection of different language throughout Africa from uh, from the ancient uh, uh, society of Ethiopia, uh, uh, Kemet, all the different societies had it connected. And since those languages are connected, it comes to uh, origin that all these people that was uh, uh, that came back to Africa after the out migration, that they came back and they just don't quite get it. It's almost like today, and you see the video with the Rodney King or something, somebody getting the hell beat out of them, but they just can't see it with their mind eye. It's the same problem that's been going on for a few thousand years, and Dr. Abinga goes through that in this new book on the lost tradition. I'm, I'm familiar with Dr. Abinga's book. In fact, I'm trying to find a proper publishing for it right now. Yes, and what now, if you read Sheik Antadiop's The Culture, Unity of Africa, and read a book by Father Temple called Bantu Philosophy, you would understand it. He said, if you want to understand the ancient Egyptian thought, study the Bantu. Now, we know that the, the word Bantu is not African. A European asked an African, what are you? and the African did not understand his language because the European and the African answer, I'm a man, Bantu. And so he wrote down, he now discovered the Bantu people, <laughs> <laughs> most numerous, same physical traits, and no such thing as a Bantu. <laughs> <laughs> the food and under, he said, I'm a man. I mean, he said, the European mean, what tribe you belong to? The African woman, he said, what are you? So the African told him what he was. He said, he is a man. Man too. Man. Man too, the mood of a man. The European don't try to understand. He's got a sick ego. He tried to pray that the world waited in darkness for him to bring the light. When, the, when, when are you going to look at the chronology of history? The first glimpse of European intelligence was a piece of folklore called the Odyssey in, in the Iliad. Rome 
Rome and Greece were not European states. They were Mediterranean African states. There were no European states at the time. And what did the Europeans call, what did the Romans and the Greeks call the Europeans of that day? The Northern Barbarians. How then is it that an African cannot claim Ethiopia and Egypt as part of his heritage when every Scandinavian schoolboy and all these people whose nation didn't even have a name when there was Roman Greece came Roman Greece as part of their heritage. He's a lying dog. Roman Greece is not a part of the heritage. It's part of the African Mediterranean heritage. Uh, Dr. Clark, uh, uh, today the uh, Europeans and the European Americans have a powerful system of control set up in Africa. Economically? Set up over the world. Over the world. Okay, but they got a powerful one set up in Africa. Okay. <laughs> so now, uh, we're getting ready to go through the 21st century, okay? Now, as, as Africans can't break that control, that stranglehold on Africa, what are we going to do? And if we, how are we going to break that control? Well, I've been advocating it for years and people thought I was out of my mind. We create a great industry in Africa with Africa. See, I would wear my clothes I don't make. We got, we're not buying European clothes anymore. I eat the food my geography produced. Now we're no longer dependent on Europe for food because Africa produced the food. I will buy nothing from Europe that cannot, that's not obtainable within Africa itself. Now Africa got a great internal trade. Now we participate in the highway system that will connect Africa with Africa. No matter how you cut it, every time you come back to it, you got a pan-African nationalist answer, or you've got no answer at all. Mm. <laughs> no, you've got to believe in yourself to do something. We've been programmed into being super consumers, but not super producers. I once said, made this proposal at a meeting from Martin Luther King, and said, if he just take off all of his clothes except his underwear and say, I wear no shit, clothes my people don't make, he could revolutionize our industry. He might understand Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi was a great Indian nationalist. He did not even believe in, he did not even help the Chinese next door who was being kicked around by the, by the Japanese. Mahatma Gandhi had one word to say about it. Went back to India when he, he was a he was a brown skinned Englishman. Went all the clothes, dead tweeds in the dead summertime and really he got ridiculed him to the point where he went back to basics. Took it all off. Went back to the spinning wheel. That's what we need to do. Go back to basics. We got a lot of pressure that we can pull, pressure levers that we, we can pull on. We're not as helpless as you think we are. I once advocated something else that somebody asked me want to have my mind examined. I still think it's a good idea. Close the continent of Africa down. Nobody comes in. Nobody goes out. We're making an inventory. <laughs> When we decide what we can do, how much gold, how much diamonds, we'll sell nothing that we don't use, we, we don't need by ourselves. We sell the surplus. You could close American industry down the first week. No gold, no diamonds, no manganese, no cobalt. When you understand the mineral wealth of Africa, the, the president known and the mineral wealth still unknown, you close Africa down for a week and see what happens. But you can't do it all in among yourself. You can't do it all by some damn religions that you didn't create in the first place. You can't do it all in over Michelangelo's religion who posed for the picture of Christ. 
the whole concept of the Christ image the creed the comforts of Nicaea number 325 AD now and the picture was painted 1500 AD between 325 AD and, and, and 1500 AD you really had no physical picture of Christ so who saved you before <laughs> now if the Son of God is white, then you assume that God is white. The European not only colonized information about history, he colonized history itself. And he colonized the image of God. What permitted the Japanese to recover from two atomic bombs and defeat? They refuse to let their enemy take away from them their God concept refuse to let their enemy take away from take them from the geography of their origins in Japan the Buddha is Japanese in Indonesia, the Buddha is Indonesian. In China, the Buddha is Chinese. In all of your churches, the Christ <laughs> is Michelangelo's relative who posed for the picture. Deal with that. Oh, uh. I just wanted to mention something uh, ask Dr. Taft what to think about. I've been fortunate to work for you for a second job for five years on a personal level. But when I came to the United States, what I realized is that no one as, a, as, a, as an activist, a political activist, declared three political parties, you went to jail, and that's for that. Same reason that he's never given a tenure at the university, because Senghor used to say we cannot do it by ourselves because we need the blood of the, the Europeans, what he called uh, the cornerstone of his theory, the symbiote, the, the, how do you call it, the metisal culture. We have to have that to be able to think rationally as a black. And the second term, he used to say no. As a young activist, we used to challenge him, telling it's too late to go back to Egypt, it's too late to do this. And he says, with all our wealth, as long as we don't have our self-esteem knowing who we are, We'll never be able to use our wealth. So, and I realize, I've just heard Dr. Clark saying that if you don't know your, your history, you will not know theirs. Does anything think that it's useful to help with the, uh, introducing second again as, a, as an activist, as a politician in Africa? Well, you have to deal with certain physical types produced by colonialism in this country. You have a bunch of, you know, cowards who, who wants to be, look, if you want to be like your oppressor so much, you are no value to your people. Now, when you look at Leopold Singo, some of his work I admire, but if we say Africa's emotion, philosophical thought is European. Now I'm off his boat right there. <laughs> because there was no philosophical thought in Europe until the African connection. Books like Stolen Legacy, the last book by uh, Obinga, Dr. Ben's work, Black Man of the Nile and the African Origins of the Major Western Religions. Then work written by white writers that whites continue to ignore, such as Gerald Massey's six volume work, Egypt, Light of the World, two volumes, Natural Genesis, two volumes, Book of the Beginning, two volumes. Whites have failed to examine the challenge to the European concept 
of superiority laid down by Europeans. Not only masses, but masses disciple. It is American disciple, Alvin Boyd Q, who wrote several books with rereading today because not only head of that time, head of this time. One called Who is this King of Glory? Another one, Shadow of the Third Century. Another one, The Lost Christianity. In John Jackson's last book, one of the finest books written on the background of Christianity by a black person, Christianity Before Christ. Even the concept of Christianity that existed in the world long before someone formulized it and dogmatized it around a character called Jesus Christ. And Europeanized it at the conference at Nasir. Move the black images from the church and replace them with white. The crime that has been committed by religion in the name of religion. This is why I have a serious question about the definition of the word religion. I don't know a single form of organized religion that had to participate in some form of slavery and servitude to people. Feudalism in Europe was a form of slavery. You can call it anything you want, put it up as much as you want. It was a form of slavery. The Alvin were in the slave trade before Islam, they're still in the slave trade. In spite of all the denial, I've got, I'm just stumbling over documents. I took this up with a Professor Bernard Lewis, who's an English professor, been at Princeton the last 21 years now, recently retired. And he, um, he mentioned a, a bit of history that I had forgotten. Either didn't care too much about I was in London in the uh, Caribbean community we wanted to hold a meeting they couldn't find a place for the meeting they realized that Parliament was not in session and we were in the House of Parliament and so we held it in the House of Parliament and I sat in Winston Church's old chair now when he built a damn empire you can't make a comfortable chair for the Prime Minister <laughs> I was telling Professor Lewis this, he said, that was a man named Chippendale, who was the father of modern great furniture. He was an Englishman. <laughs> so that means we can make a decent chair if we care to make one. The main thing he, 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 he called attention to, his works on the Arabs and the slave trade, and, and he sent me uh, debates from the House of Lords 1960 on slavery in Africa and, and, and Arabia well somebody could deny that the Arabs in Islam have not been in the slave trade is to deny all those documents that I'm stumbling over in my study and getting new ones every day picked up a PhD thesis by a, or a person from the Sudan Dr. Lane on slavery in Sudan I know a pro Arab Sudanese who speak good Arabic and was editor of the Sudan rap notes and records. He's pro Arabic, yet when he wrote his PhD thesis, he wrote a leading chapter on slavery in the Sudan. I read a, a book called um, Moving a Car to Africa. And there's some information on the box treaty less than 20 years after the Arabs entered Africa they imposed a treaty on the Sudan in which the Sudan had to deliver 360 slaves a year and they declared war when they couldn't well somebody said there had been no slave in the Sudan is, is beyond me and I, I don't even argue and I could give them a list of my documents but uh, this is far afield from the qu question but it, it needs to be said that 
If you teach for a living, you've got to be acquainted with information that proves your point. You cannot be ridiculous in the classroom, not even a little while, especially if you're black. Because Christ in the classroom proclaim all things they can't prove, but after all, they control the power structures, the promotion structure, everything else, you know. I wrote an article called The Myth of Black Antisemitism, and I proved my point, proved it well. And all these organizations asked that I be fired. The president said it was academic freedom. And besides, I've got all my documents together. And said, why not argue with his documents? They kept arguing here and there. And they couldn't disprove not a single thing I said. Because most of the documents came from them. Including <laughs> Jewish documents. Jewish scholar. Finally, I come up with, after three years, you're supposed to wait five years and be considered for promotion at the time, to be promoted for full professor tenure. The committee was 100% Jewish. I got it on the first ballot, ballot you know. Well, they might have hated my guts. They knew one damn thing. If they turn me down for tenure, they have a hard time putting lesser professors up for tenure without explaining why they turned me down. That's far for you what you're saying. We'll take another question. From the ladies, if you don't mind, I, <laughs> that question is generally sharp. From the ladies? They've been a little too solid tonight. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Lewis. Thanks, uh, Dr. Carr, um, for this uh, lecture on uh, Dr. Stephen Uh I like to express my feelings, my my emotions, as a follower of Dr. Stephen Tejo from 1976. He's still dead in Senegal. Mm -hmm. And I am very proud to meet um, former uh, friends who used to be in the same political party as Dr. Job sitting here, his brother sitting here, Dan Babu, um, there is another brother there. Um, I am very glad that this is an occasion that uh, we are convening here tonight, uh, celebrating uh, the 10th. Uh, anniversary of the death of the uh, great African thinker, our leader, mm -hmm. Dr. Shehan Thanks so much. Uh, I'd like to contribute, uh, if you don't mind, uh, about his contribution uh, during this uh, uh, cultural uh, uh, disruption in uh, Africa and uh, uh, African descent around the world. Uh, Dr. Job was very concerned about the colonial system. You know, the system, uh, colonialism, was deeply uh, oriented in colonizing the mind of Africans. Mm -hmm. That was their main process. Mm -hmm. and Dr. Job was a very good technician in restoring African culture into African community. Uh, trying to build this there, uh, and especially in Senegal. Dr. Job said, uh, we have to teach uh, Senegalese, uh, Senegalese language. That's the first step. You, you know that about 10% of the population only in Senegal are educated. Yes. Only 10% of the population went to school. The European so only, I mean, uh, they set up their school and only allow 10% of the population to be able to attend. Right. So 90% of the population were out. So how come out of 10% of the population uh, who are going to be the leaders, because those are the people who know how to read, how to write, how to speak French. 
So obviously, learning the French system, they they are they were allowed and they are still allowed to work in the system which is set by France, even though they say that the country is independent. So where is independence in that situation? Well, okay. yeah. There is no independence. There is no independence. Your independence is something you make yourself. So Dr. Jones say we have to learn African language and set up uh, and do uh, high research, intensive research to help Africans learn their own language, to be able to restore the culture, in, you know, in, in, the, in the African community. That was a major contribution to me because, uh, um, I mean, besides his scientific contribution, but considering the social aspect, I was very amazed about it because during all my schooling in Africa, I had difficulties, like any African who went to school in the French system, we had difficulties communicating with our own uh, community, even with our own parents, because the system could make us uh, nothing but foreigners in our own country. So, um, thanks to Dr. Joe for that. Uh, in responding to a brother who just uh, uh, asked about uh, the 21st century, uh, that's my concern too. Uh, I have been meeting with, uh, I have been having meetings with a lot of uh, friends, uh, brothers and sisters about it. And uh, I believe that for us to be able to face the 21st century, which is not far, in four years, uh, we have to be entrepreneurial. Uh, we have to think of entrepreneurship, uh, try to create something, invest, put money together, and try to develop it as much as we can and work with the continent. That's very important. Uh, the continent is very rich, broad of potentiality, and I believe that any humankind should start with his community to be able to get up and out do something. And uh, that's why I'm inviting uh, everyone, everybody, to, to develop entrepreneurship, especially these days uh, when we have cut off all of them. And we are the first people to be gone. Better is cutting off city, uh, municipal, you know, everybody is cutting off. Private companies are cutting off. If we don't have companies and get laid off, uh, what we going to be homeless. And uh, we have to be producers and consumers to be able to, to make that work. I'm familiar with Shakespeare's work on linguistics, and that work has not been translated into English yet. And I have, that was one of the books he gave me on our first meeting in his uh, laboratory. Shakespeare has at least five books that haven't been translated into English. And I believe in the restoration of not only African language, but the full restoration of African cultures and, and customs. And we've lost too much that belonged to us. I can remember that <clears throat> my father grabbed me by the ear and drug me home and gave me the beating of my life. And I kept asking what was it for? He said, you passed by that old lady and didn't say, excuse me, and had not even said, good morning. Disrespect to old people in this family is not a negotiable item. You do not get punished the second time. You get punished the first time. Now, we came to this country with some great respect for old people. You can measure the culture and the civilization of a people by what extent they are civil to the very old, the very young, the sick, and the needy. In spite of slavery, we had not lost that. And yet, in the civil rights movement, in the aftermath of the civil rights movement, when we used the wrong phraseology, we was asking for the wrong thing, we should never ask for integration, we should ask for desegregation and justice. The 
the NACP got us into a syndrome. We didn't get out of it. We kept trying to be most unlike ourselves. And as Blyden said in his inaugural address, Library of College, 1881, we feed grist into other people's mills. And nothing comes out except what has been put in. Okay, so last question, yes. Okay, I have one quick question. Um, you mentioned earlier that it's important possibly for Africa to close the store, to take inventory. Um, a lot of people in the classroom and the school is dedicated to developing agents, the development, developmental agents. Um, and across the board, it seems like on all indices of development, how it's measured, Africa has flipped and has flipped for the last 30 years. Do you see a, or would you advocate a pulling out, pulling out of developmental organizations? No. Africa is not being developed for Africa's sake. Africa is being developed to, to accommodate corporations Ameri and American capitalism. And Africa is being developed by African puppets who bought and paid for what I'm saying would still be valuable still close the damn door down and take an inventory of yourself now during the years when America was allegedly boycotting China they had almost a 20 year period when they weren't recognized in the United Nations they weren't recognized in the diplomatic service of the world but during that 20 years the Japanese, the Chinese got them with the Chinese and pulled themselves together when they finally came out from behind that closed door. They had some strength that was more than tantamount to world power. It was world power. Think about it. Think about it. What was they doing that 20 years? <laughs> Africa need to think up, think about it. Pull off the, some of the European clothes. African clothes are cheaper and more comfortable too. <laughs> <laughs> and they need to understand something else that might offend you. Okay, thank you. That to be a real African committed to the glory and the respect of Africa your choice of a wife should be an African woman. And this can rub your feeling the wrong way if you want to. But the Japanese for three generations sent their children to all the schools of the world. They mastered enough technology until 1905 the Russians started messing with them and they had a butt kicking contest and the Japanese won the contest. Of all the things the Japanese brought home, there's no record of a single Japanese bringing home a non-Japanese wife. Think about it. Um, I think that uh, this was really saying thank you to Professor Clark. And I hope you will be around for many other events we want to organize. I just want you to, I failed to do that at the very beginning. There is a, some kind of a founding group, which is, as I said, not exclusive. You could get into it if you want to work with us. There's no problem and no limitation. And of which, of course, Professor John Henry Clark is the chair, is the honorary chair. Uh, the vice chair is Professor Obenga. And uh, among the members around here tonight, we have Dan Babu, who is a journalist here. Uh, we have Claude Ford, who is a pediatrician. Uh, with his Claude? Uh, okay, Claude Ford. Uh, we have uh, Mark Job. Uh, his name is on the board. We have uh, Sadio Jallo. His name is on the board. And uh, all of them are part of the committee. And if you want to join, no problem. Just let, let us know and contact us at these numbers.
Thank you very much. And goodbye.